more people coming in. Hello, everybody. You're Bye, everybody. Thought. Yes. All right, just a couple more moments. Thank you for joining us at the mill. Uh, we are in our annual innovation week. We dedicate the whole week to en entrepreneurship and technology. Today, we're featuring one of our core sponsors, Metro Star Systems. Uh, they're not only a member here at the mill, but um, just a really great supporter of everything we're trying to do in Bloomington. So we have Hussein Sultan and Ben Linquist with us today. And they are going to do a much better job introducing themselves than I could. So I'm going to kick it off to Hussein and let him tell you everything he's going to, everything he knows about scalable data processing and machine learning in Python. Okay. Thank you so much. Sorry about that. I believe I was muted before. Thank you so much, Melissa. Really appreciate the uh, introduction. I am Hussein Sultan. I am a director of AI at Metrostar. Metro, at Metrostar, um, AI is a nascent practice, and Ben and I and others are kicking it off. So today, we are here to talk to you guys about data processing and machine learning, but especially how it may interact with just scalability. So before I go a little bit deeper into our talk, uh, I, my intro, I was, uh, I led data and machine learning efforts at Capital One before. I also had my own consulting and I will let Ben Lindquist uh, introduce himself. Hello, I'm Ben Lindquist. Um, I've got a lot of background in building scalable systems. I used to build back ends for online advertising. So they would have to process millions of transactions per second and deal with all that data. And for the last four years, I've been applying that scalability knowledge to AI and machine learning, including at places like Capital One and Breakout Capital Finance. Awesome, thank you so much, Ben. Um, and a, a little bit about MetroStar. We are about 21 years old. Uh, we have three practice areas. Uh, the, the fourth one is, is AI that is not there yet. Uh, we are in Bloomington or, or Indiana. Uh, and uh, we've been uh, a 32% female led organization. So let's talk about machine learning and, and sort of the high level of, of overview of what that process is like. So, the first comes with the data. So that you have, you know, just some way to extract the data or to get access to it. This data may be raw, it may be clean, it may be um, noisy, but like that's the first step. And like that's my data engineering bucket. Uh, the idea here is that you want to be able to correctly read the data, understand what that data represents, have the metadata for it, and then also to clean it um, and to turn it into a nice tidy data that could be fed into the downstream machine learning process. So what is that downstream, downstream process? Um, so like the, the first step in, in like machine learning is generally about you know, your feature engineering or pre-processing. Uh, you're either just scaling features or uh, you know, you're creating new, new um, sort of combined features as well. Uh, the data enrichment it also comes in there as well that hey you may realize in this sort of process that you don't have enough data so you will go and find others and combine them together the, the third pro the, the third step is the is the insight generation and like that's where the machine learning happens that's where you would train the model so you have the the a training data set or, or like some way of, of labeling it, you know, you know, however that is, you, you, you already have that present. And now you are actually going to kick off the model training process and try to find the best types of models. So like hyper parameter tuning. And then, you know, there's also visualizations and just sharing it with your colleagues. The fourth process is like, you know, okay, you have the model, you have like, Built it now. You will like you know assess it and then to deploy it for to production or uh, the to downstream to consumption. So that your model is able to produce some type of to prediction and like and you're going to use that for a downstream process. 
so like what's you know you know interesting about this is that it's a it's an iterative process and it's also just cyclical like you will essentially go in this loop uh, over and over again you may bounce back and uh, back and forth between inside generation and feature engineering uh, uh, or the the model evaluation as well um, and this you know um, Iterative sort of process takes leads us to a place where we may want interactive compute, and and in, in, in this case, I mean interactivity as in that as a data scientist, you are able to, to compute uh, or to do a, uh, a targeted competition to it, and then be able to get the results back quickly at interactive speeds. Now, in machine learning, when we talk about just scalability. Uh, the way to uh, think about it is, is in like two dimensions. The x-axis here is the data size. So like as your you know, input data size is increasing, uh, you would have uh, different types of just scalability issues there. And on the y-axis, we have model size. The model size is actually the size of the model itself and, and can it be uh, to train in a, a single machine or a distributed way, et cetera. So on the, the bottom left, our the first box is, is essentially where the, the data fits into your laptop or your, your computer's RAM. And uh, this is the, you know, sort of your traditional scikit-learn style models uh, where the uh, data fits in there as well. And the, the model size is, is, uh, not, uh, is also uh, on the, smaller side. So, so as you, you know, increase the model size on this uh, axis, uh, what you'll be able to do is that you can now horizontally just scale your model training. So, so these are the processes like hyperparameter tuning or cross validation, where you are still taking the same model, uh, which can be trained on a, on a, on a uh, that fits into your memory, but you are now going to do a lot of them so you can horizontally just scale those. Um, and that problem is essentially compute bound because you are just looking for more compute. On the x-axis, you are you're memory bound. So you are actually, you, you, you need to process more data uh, in the RAM and you do not have enough RAM uh, or, or in a single uh, laptops or your server's RAM. So, you know, as we go there from uh, from bottom left to bottom right, what we will be able to do is like now add more to machines and algorithmically just scale our our uh, model building of data processing process. And and as we go up to the top right, of uh, now we will need like algorithmic uh, scalability because our model size does not fit in the RAM and our the data doesn't either, so like we need to be able to train the model in a distributed way. And, and the you know sort of the examples here are the parameter servers or, or how like XGBoost will will uh, uh, scale up in a, a distributed manner. So that's our our sort of world of scalability, and and our you know the, depending on the problem, you may be in one of these four buckets. So let's talk about our problem at hand and, and the demonstration that we're going to give you guys. So uh, in this case, our problem is that given a set of PCAP files, I would like to automatically uh, to predict which one of them may have some kind of a threat. And in this case, the data set is coming from a Canadian Cyber Institute and they created this the training data set um, across hundreds of machines, I think about 450, and then attacked it in just several different ways. And that gave us, uh, gave us the labels. So we have the you know, raw PCAP files, and then we also have the labels of like what type of attacks are contained in them. And, and if we just think about this problem a little bit more, and to break it down on the data engineering side, our a full PCAP data size is about 600 gigs compressed, so gzipped. And then we have the pre-processing and feature engineering side, we're about, about the same because we're essentially going to take in all of that 600 gigs, process it, 
And then we're going to go into the uh, uh, insight generation model building phase, and we will just sample the types of labels that we want in our training data set. And then, and then we basically are left with about 10 gigs of data. And you know, once we have our model building process uh, scaled out, and, and like we have done all of our hyperparameter tuning, the final model size is actually less than 100 MB. So what type of problem is this? It's a large data, small model problem, which means that it is a memory bound, right? So, and then Bob's your uncle, like we have, you know, sort of this memory bound, um, uh, you know, the, the space where we will need to distribute our data processing. However, the model fitting or the model training can be done on a single machine. With that said, I will hand it over to Ben Lindquist and he will walk us through how we, we, we went about processing this type of data, and then also how do we just scale it and the, the properties of it. Ben? Thanks, Hussein. First off, uh, a little introduction. Uh, if you don't know what a PCAP file is, it's basically binary data straight off of a network interface. So when uh, this institute created this training set, what they were doing is running a capture program on all of the machines that they uh, stood up as part of a kind of a fake enterprise. So they stood up a bunch of instances in Amazon and on every single one of those instances, they ran a process, could have been Wireshark, could have been TCP dump, that was simply monitoring the network interface of the machine and writing the raw packet contents of every packet to disk. The results of those are PCAB files. They attacked some of the machines uh, that had been stood up at various times with various attacks, and they kept track of what did they attack when with what type of attack. So that's giving us a beautifully labeled training set for a uh, machine learning model. Going to share my screen now. Okay. So uh, this is a Jupyter notebook and uh, it's running in Jupyter lab on MetroStar's open source machine learning environment. This lets us do a single sign-on into the Azure cloud and uh, run all kinds of different projects. And it gives us access to scalable data processing using a system called Dask. Um, so, as Hussein mentioned, there are 600 gigabytes of PCAP files in this data set. Um, to explain some, some prep, the first thing we had to do was download all of that. It was in gigantic uh, zipped up TARs, and we had to unzip those and pull out the individual files and then upload those to Azure blob storage. The reason we put them in Azure blob storage is that as we spin up lots of workers in a compute cluster, which we're gonna use Dask to do, as we spin up those workers, each worker can grab specific files down from Azure to process, and that can happen in parallel. So we've got all these PCAPs in Azure. I'm gonna start running through this, this notebook. I've connected to Azure now, and you can see we have 4,453 PCAP files. And here's an example name of one of them and size. This one's only 470K. Some of these files 
are uh, as big as 10 meg. Let's, let's look at what are the biggest files here. So actually, yeah, th this is a pretty large one. This is four gig. That's a big file. Uh, we've got a lot of data here. Now there's some uh, munging we have to do because you, you've got all these files uh, and the way that the data is labeled is based on the file name. The file name includes uh, the IP address of the machine where the capture took place and it includes the day that was being captured. The attacks are listed by the target IP and the time it took place. So we have to, for, to label our data, we have to match those things together. And that's what this next uh, block of code is gonna do. So we build a dictionary of, these are all the combinations of machine and day that included attacks. And the dictionary also includes what type of attack was it. That lets us now build a set of files that we're actually going to process. We're not going to process all 600 gig. Um, but what we want to do as a data scientist, the, the task here is to get the right subset of data that's going to allow a model to be trained well. So the right subset includes all the attacks. So that's what this next part does, is it specifically includes any file that has attacks in it. And that gives us 23 files. Now, the right subset always includes more than what you're looking for. It needs to include a lot of data that doesn't have what you're looking for. That way, the model's presented with positive examples and negative examples. So we're going to randomly add other files into this. So now I've got a set of 500 files, and it's 57 gigabytes of size. And that is too big to deal with uh, featureization just on my machine. So now what I'm going to talk about is what was our approach to try to detect these attacks within the files? And we had an interesting idea, kind of an experiment. We wondered if we were to visualize the TCP flows and hand the visualizations to a convolutional neural network, would we be able to detect time series behavior without having to use a recurrent network model? A CNN uh, is the basic type of image detection neural net. These are what have had so much success in classifying images within or, or classifying objects within images. Um, and you can find standard examples of how to use a CNN, standard tutorials, and they'll do really well at saying, is that a cat or a dog in that image? Um, we wanted to use that because it, it just works so well and it doesn't require a lot of tweaking. You have to feed it an image. So the notion of taking something that happens over a time period and turning it into an image as your featureization, that's the interesting technique we wanted to explore. Now, a TCP flow, what is that? That is a series of packets that are sent over a time period back and forth between two specific machines. And all of the attack flows that we're looking to detect are that. They involve two machines, an attacking machine and a target. 
and packets will go from the attacking machine to the target, from the target to the attacking machine. Now, when you capture raw packet data in a PCAP file, you're capturing all the packets sent by that machine to all of the other machines it was communicating with. And these machines were communicating with a lot of other hosts all at the same time. So the packets for a particular flow are really interlaced or interspersed with packets of other flows. So the first task in featurizing this data is you've got to be able to turn a PCAP into TCP flows. And um, that is the job of this little Python script. Um, it's not a super long script. But let me kind of describe what it does. Um, what it's going to do is it's going to process the output of TCP dump. Um, Python does not deal very well with binary data, binary packet data. There's a Unix utility called TCP dump. Um, you can use it on Windows in the form of win dump. TCP dump will read in a PCAP and if you give it the right command line switches, it will give you text information about the packet headers. The packet header describes the time, the size of the packet, what sent it, what received it. So to build flows, we only need the packet header information. So we're going to use TCP dump to process the PCAPs and output the packet header information. We stream that packet header information into this Flowify script. And Flowify is simply going to sort them by the pairs of IPs. So if you get a packet that's from IP A to IP B, and you get another packet that's from B to A, those are part of the same flow. They need to be sorted by time. That's what the script does. It will build us all the flows that are the two, any two uh, IP port combinations. Uh, port comes in because you might actually have two machines communicating two flows at the same time. Each will have a distinct port on each machine. Um, so this little script will sort that stuff. And then what it does after sorting is you can, you can take one of these, these objects that represents a specific flow and request an image back. And you'll see some of the images in a little bit. Um, and once I show you some of the images, I'll talk about how that visualization happened. How did this flow script produce the images in that way? Let's go back to Flowify. So, so our featureization process, we've got to run TCP dump on the file. We've got to stream the output of that into our Flowify script and then collect the flow objects that come out of that. We need to do that across 500 files now. So we're going to use Dask. Uh, Dask in our uh, compute environment lets me request a compute cluster dynamically from Kubernetes. So we've got Kubernetes stood up in Azure. It's got a, uh, a number of machines joined to it that gives us raw compute capacity. And I'm gonna build up a cluster now. So I first have to connect to the gateway and I, need, I now tell it uh, what type of containers I want as workers in my cluster. I'm gonna request two cores. That's important uh, that it's not just one core because I'm streaming from Azure into a TCP dump process and then into a Flowify process. So there are actually three processes that need to run to featureize one of these files. So it's helpful to have more than one core. I don't need a lot of RAM, however. The files 
many of them are bigger than a gig, but I never have to put a whole file into memory at once because I'm streaming from process to process to process. Um, and then I say what image I would like. So then just a, a quick thought here of that, like, the streaming that like large PCAP file that will not fit into the one gig of RAM. That's an example of algorithmic scalability where we are now just streaming it instead of, you know, actually loading it up all the way into our, into our memory. Okay. So you can see the workers spinning up here. My cluster is being built. And one of the nice things about Dask is it gives me this dashboard where I can see the processing being done. We'll come back to this in just a second. I'm going to connect to my cluster. I'm going to upload my scripts. So this is that flow.py that actually sorts out the flows and is able to visualize them. Uh, so we'll get back flow objects flow dask.py right here this is what's going to do that streaming and i'll get into that later all right so now we want to kick off this process so we configure a bag with the names of the files we want to process and remember i built that collection of files earlier of 500 files so now let's process these across the workers. We can see all the tasks here allocated across the workers by Dask, and they're going to start doing them as fast as they can. Each one of these lines that gets completed and drawn on the screen means that a file was pulled down from Azure, processed through TCP dump, and then through the Flowify Python script producing a set of flows and was returned for collection. And at this point, I want to check the Q&A. Oh, well, I can't see it. I'll and check it is, once I stop sharing. Yep, I can't see any any Q and A's yet. Okay. So yeah, uh, Melissa, if there are any questions at this point, um, I might be able to answer while we watch this processing happen. Uh, I don't see any questions yet, but uh, attendees, feel free to put them in the Q and A section for us. A little bit about Dask here. Dask is a Python native, uh, basically a just scalable just Python framework, and it has some cool things to it. So, like what we're using right now is a, a Dask bag, which is a, a collection. A Dask also provides a, a data frame collection as well. So, if you guys are familiar with Pandas, uh, uh, which is a, a single machine sort of a memory bound, compute bound, um, sorry, memory bound thing. Uh, for pandas, um, uh, Dask can, can essentially just scale that out as, as like a Dask data frame collection. So you get, you know, a familiar API. And so, like, you know, as long as you know a little bit of pandas, you can still use Dask data frame and the process on, on like large data. So what we're doing here um, is a little bit more custom, right? Where we're taking PCAP files, we are, we are generating um, a way to, to to process them in to memory or in a, a small memory to a footprint. So there are some optimizations here as well. Hussein, can you see the questions while I leave my screen yes. um, shared? There are a couple of questions. How do you know when you have enough data before you can move forward? I think that's something Ben you are about to answer next. Well, I. I like to take a guess at it and then iterate. 
with amounts of data. Typically, I would take a guess. So, you know, my guess here, my initial guess, I might have tried 100 files. Um, and then I would train a model and see uh, how that model behaves. Um, does it overfit after just a few epochs? Uh, what kind of accuracy do I get? And then I would try more data and uh, try to get a sense for how much predictiveness is in the data. Um, you can kind of tell from your model how much predictiveness um, it was able to find. So you have to iterate. And if you go back to Hussein's first slide where he showed that four step process, really you might go from step one to two and iterate between those for a while until you think your featureization is good and then move to three and try training your model and see that, well, you really don't get any accuracy and go back to one and so on. Uh, so we've processed this stuff. So let me, let me proceed here and, um, and then I'll, is there another question Hussein? that I should be ready for? Yep, so there's another question. How good is a system at triaging and restarting if there is an error along the way into processing run? He's saying, can you talk to that? Um, Absolutely. I know Dask is very good at that kind yep. of thing. So the Dask has, has uh, a task restarts as well. Um, but it is generally like the task is a low level framework. It will optimize your task scheduling and like, and like make sure uh, that, that uh, you know, workers that need more work have it. Um, but in general, if your task fails because of an error, the task is really good at providing you the logs. Um, and, uh, and you know, if there's a, a runtime error, you may have to restart it manually because Dask you know, does not operate at at like managing your like your full tasks, right? So like there are there are other options like Airflow so that can take up uh, the task and then you know ensure that it is completed and 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 um, and, and and also your prefect as well as a, a good example for those things. Okay, so we processed 500 files, and again, that was 57 gig, and we did it in three minutes and 37 seconds. That was across 61 workers. And we got back our flow objects. So first thing is take that dictionary and uh, build a training set. And I just did that. One thing I, I want to note here that in the Flowify that we sent to the workers, I'm sampling in here. Um, so I pass in that dictionary that lets uh, attack labels be determined. And that's important because if if I were to pass back every flow from those files, I would blow up the memory in my notebook, in, in the Python kernel that my notebook is using. So I sent the sampling out to the workers so I would get back pre-sampled data sets. So I have some sampling rates here. And this is something that I really did a lot of trial and error to figure out what's a good sampling rate for these things. And this has a lot to do with balancing the data set as well. Some of the attacks generated so many packets, I did not want all of them. So I have different sampling rates for different types of attack. And, and that, that's something uh, very important. When you distribute your featureization, you will probably need to distribute your random sampling as well. And sampling is, is important here because we want our training data set to have all types of attacks. And, and we want to make sure that the model sees each attack uh, with a weight that we think is appropriate. So that you want to have some benign as well as, you know, all of the types of attacks that, that um, Ben is showing up here. Yep. And I wanted to have more benign. 
um, than attack because the tricky thing about this is that a benign flow is so varied um, that if you only have a few of them, you're going to think that your model's very accurate when it's not because there may be a lot of types of traffic that look like the attacks, but you haven't had your model train on those. Um, so here's an inventory of what we got back. We got back 50,000 benign flows, 10,000 DDoS low orbit ion canon, UDP flows, 14,000 bot, five infiltration, et cetera. Now we're gonna look at, at what those images look like and we can talk about the visualization style here. So I'm showing the infiltrations because they're the most interesting. So here we have five examples of how we are featurizing this TCP flow data. Time moves from the left to the right. So the first packet sent is all the way on the left and the last packet sent will be farthest to the right. One of the IPs is at the top and the other IP is at the bottom. So every packet is a line. So suppose IP address A is top and IP address B is bottom. All the lines coming down from the top were sent from A to B. All the lines moving up from the bottom were sent from B to A. Pretty simple. The length of each line is proportional to the size of the packet, but on a logarithmic scale. So you will see more difference in terms of screen real estate or, or image real estate, the smaller the packet is, the larger the packet is, the less difference, or, or let's say the uh, less difference per delta between the lines. And then time is a logarithmic scale as well, so that we get more detail in the beginning of the flow. And as we move toward the edge of the image, the lines are compressed in, we're getting less detail. And I did this because I've got a fixed image size and a fixed time, I mapped a fixed time scale to that. So I wanted to be able to show a lot more time in the image thereby, you know, and, and in order to do that, I had to compress it. But I didn't want to compress it in the beginning, which I thought would be the most significant part of the flow for detection. Uh, so this is what the visualizations look like. And we're just going to hand these straight to a convolutional neural net. So I'm going to further downsample this. So this is a second sampling step that I'm doing locally. So I've sampled out 2,500 attack flows and 4,900 benign flows. Now I'm going to just show some random examples. So here's a benign one. Let's keep going through this. You can see the benign flows vary greatly from each other. I mean, who knows what they are? Somebody going to a web page, somebody logging in, so many different things. Here's a DOS slow loris. And there another benign flow. All right, now the next thing I'm going to do is go back through those flows. And instead of outputting images that we can look at, I'm going to output images that are actually NumPy arrays. Because it is NumPy arrays that our TensorFlow model can train on. Um, and it can only train on NumPy arrays. Now, a, an image is just a 2D array. These images are black and white, so you can easily represent that data as a two-dimensional NumPy array. And here's, I've, I've uh, by the way, I threw out the FTP uh, brute force attacks. They're just one packet and they're so, in fact, they're identical to many kinds of benign flows. You can't tell the difference. So I threw those out. Those are useless for this type of detection technique. 
Um, all right, so we've got a training set of NumPy arrays. Now I'm going to set up a pretty standard convolutional neural net. You can see the ReLU activations, uh, max pooling, Conv2D, this is all standard stuff. I did put a multi-class head uh, or output layer on top of it. So we will not just detect, is this an attack or not? We will detect what type of attack. That's defined. And now I'm gonna kick off the training. This is running on CPU, so it's a little slow. Um, so we can take some more questions while this is running. Yep, so there's a, um, there a question. To what types of attacks does this work well for? Does it have any limitations? Okay, great question. I, I already started answering it. The FTP brute force attacks were just uh, one or two packets. This does not work well for those because many benign flows are going to be one or two packets, um, an ARP request. It's a send and get a response. It'll look just like the FTP brute force. So that's an example of an attack that is not complex enough to be distinct enough when visualized this way uh, to, to make this technique useful for it. The infiltration attacks, however, if I go back up here, these are very distinctive. So the technique works well on these. Also, the, uh, this DOS slow loris, pretty distinctive behavior, especially at the beginning here. It, it seems to work well with that as well. Excuse me. Um, any other questions? You can see we're now above 80% accuracy. And uh, once this training is done, it's going to validate on a holdout set that we created earlier. So we'll see what the true accuracy is. One thing that I will add is that this accuracy metric can be misleading if you don't understand it properly because we have a multi-class um, classification problem. Uh, we would want to see a confusion matrix, which can tell you to a false, a false positive, to true positive, to precision, to recall, those types of metrics, because like that can actually let you see what type of classes are being predicted well and like which ones may not be. Uh, also, the, the other color is that uh, this is taking a long time because we're doing it on a CPU. Now, the GPUs are really good at matrix multiplication and hence like, you know, fitting these types of models. Um, NVIDIA has a, a open source library called Rapids uh, or a open source effort called Rapids. And in the Rapids ecosystem, uh, um, is basically built upon uh, upon Dask, and it allows us to like, scale from CPU to, to GPUs as well. So you can scale out in a distributed manner, but you can also scale up with this with with um, exotic hardware like GPUs. In this particular one, we have a we've trained it on GPU before. We we have a version of this hub that I'm using that runs on GPU. And so then this, this trains a lot faster um, with CUDA on the NVIDIA GPU. Training's almost done. We're above 90% training accuracy. And then it'll run the validation in a little bit. And our holdout in this case, Ben, is 20%. Yes, I believe so. Let's see. I see it. It was 20% down there. Oh, is this where I did the holdout? Yep. Yep. Test size point to zero. Mm -hmm. Yep, right here. Okay, so validation accuracy 
99%. So uh, what this basically told us is that this is a useful technique to explore further. It's possible to take time series data and use a visualization to uh, feed that into a convolutional neural network. Absolutely. We have one more question. Can the triggers and alerts be set for types of attacks? That's one of the things you would use something like this for, definitely. Um, you have to worry, though, about inference time. Um, this net isn't super big, uh, but if you were processing live network traffic with it, you'd probably have to scale it out quite significantly in order to process the packets fast enough to do live alerts. Um, so I would be more likely to use this, uh, instead of in an alerting, alerting mode, I would use this for threat hunting and take specific machines within an environment, do packet capture on them, maybe run a week long capturing uh, period, then gather that and then spin up a large infrastructure and scale it out to process all of those at once and look for indications of advanced persistent threats. Uh, so I would probably retrain this on uh, the types of rootkit traffic, um, and tunneling traffic that would be indicators of APTs, and I would use it that way. I, I think the inference time is going to be too great to use it on live network traffic as, say, an IDS. Yep, so now the, the model has been saved and you could like save it in, a, in an S3 bucket, you could like version it, you can, you can, you, you know, you can basically build your own, own like system around how you may want to manage it. And then it could be served up as a, a restful endpoint. And as, and as um, Ben mentioned that, um, you know, you would have large PCAP files. So you'd want to, you know, spend some time scaling the, the feature engineering and then also the, latency that is just there because of a deep learning model, which is not very, very deep. So it might be pretty fast actually. Um, also, uh, one more thing to add before we, we essentially go to the like, like Q and A's, uh, we will have this code open sourced and, and available to you guys. Please just follow Microsoft systems on Twitter um, and, and like, we'll be making those announcements um, as this code is like, finalized and we have this uh, demonstration available to you guys as well. Well, we still have some time. Uh, I want to say the, the, the part that I'm most proud of, um, surprisingly, is not the visualization. It's the, the way that I was able to stream the data uh, on the Dask workers. I actually, I'm doing things that Dask doesn't want me to do, which is really fun for me. I actually, the, the script I send to the workers writes a Python script and then executes it in a separate process and creates a FIFO, a Unix FIFO on disk so that it can, it can spawn off the process that streams the file from Azure into the FIFO. Then it spawns TCP dump to read from that FIFO and it uh, processes the results that TCP dump streams out to standard output. So that was a lot of fun, I, especially the writing the Python script and then launching it. Would you to call it uh, poor man's Kafka? <laughs> uh, no, I, I wouldn't. I would call it hacking, I think. <laughs> um, Love it. So don't do what, what like Ben did in terms of hacking. Unless you have to. Unless you have to. 
Very cool. Um, any other questions, comments? I'm also monitoring chat as well. Here it is. Will COVID impact our available to identify and respond to attacks? COVID impact. Will it? People might I, be doing more more attacks because of the surface area might have increased because of yep. everyone being on the digital. I think the surface area has definitely increased. Um, I think also some SOCs or security operations centers that are dependent on having people co-located physically are not going to operate well in this environment. Um, so the whole notion of a SOC needs to be rethought um, and, and you need to be able to have people uh, doing their jobs virtually, which one would think would be pretty straightforward in the case of, of cyber defense. Um, but in a lot of environments, it might not be. They, they may not have set up all their accesses for remote because they were concerned about uh, security. So the SOC has to be rethought. That would be my comment. Uh, we have one more question. This relies on humans classifying each of the sets of training data, or is it also possible to then use your algorithms to classify future training sets? This uh, relies on, yeah. This, this one, what's nice about this one is this is, this is a special case. It's not really humans classifying the training data. This was humans initiating attacks and simply recording what attack they ran and what their targets were. And that allows us to label the training data just from the inventory of attacks. So it's, it's sort of a hybrid. There's not a lot of human work here um, to, to label this stuff. But this brings up an important point, which is the data labeling. So a big part of machine learning relies on like labeled examples to like learn from. And that does tend to be hard to like generate or could be costly to like to generate those types mm -hmm. of data sets that like you could imagine that for this data set, there was a 450 machines were, were run over a significant time, uh, amount of time. And it, would, it, it basically took a lot of your coordination um, to, to generate that. I have a question for you, Hussein. Go for it. Um, what kind of, in, in what kind of use case would we want to use Kafka? <laughs> um, uh, enterprise, uh, enterprise streaming, where you have many, many teams. Um, okay. And you, you also require scale, where you need to just scale out with the size of data. So okay. it's like, yeah. Thank Which you I didn't need because I'm setting up my own stream per file already. So Correct. there's no central uh, scaling requirement. So this is actually a very interesting point. So like you don't want to choose a tool that does more than what you need for the job, right? Mm -hmm. Because that because that tool might come with a lot of overhead that we may not have expected before. So like to actually run Kafka in your production, that's a hard job that like you need. Mm -hmm. You have you know, the people with like big beards who, who like basically do that. Um, that's not our, like, you know, that could be hard to like manage. Mm -hmm. So in our case, when we're doing machine learning and we are being that, that iterative, we want our tools to be, you know, easily able to, uh, or to be flexible to our, our evolving needs. And in this case, the Jupyter Notebook, Jupyter Hub, Dask, uh, Rapids, number, you know, these kind of things come together that you can do very advanced uh, the things that may seem like magic, but you were able to do them pretty quickly 
and, and like that's what Jaben was able to demonstrate to us today. That we and got. blob storage. Blob storage is okay. is hugely valuable. Very valuable, absolutely. Uh, so that's a that's the kind of, you know lightweight set of tools that can allow you to do a lot of these type types of things very quickly. And in the enterprise, these tools are being adopted more and more because it provides kind of velocity to like go from you know the beginning of your, your product of your project to, to the end uh, as a deployed machine learning model. And, and a complex data science project, you may need to try a thousand experiments. And, and an experiment here is any combination of your, of the four boxes uh, that Hussein had in his first slide. Uh, your pulling of your data, how you featureize your data, how you've tuned your model, and then how are you testing your model or validating your model you may have to to try combinations of those things thousands of times so think about how long it takes to do one of those iterations if one of those iterations is taking you two days your project might take you years so that's that's why we're so uh concerned about flexibility and um and because, it, because we need to iterate rapidly in order to get the benefit of large numbers of experiments to, to tune the models and tune the featureization. A question for you, Ben, and we have about uh, four minutes left. Um, so looking back at this experiment uh, where, where we have you know, explored this domain, uh, what are the next steps here to improve upon it? Well, I think we need a, I think we need a different training set. I like the technique that they use to produce this set of, of having folks run attacks against a kind of simulated enterprise. <clears throat> I would use the same technique, but instead of detecting the types of attacks that any IDS or fire, you know, fire, eye, snort, whatever, uh, bro ids they're all they're already going to detect all these things i'd be more interested in building a set that's about looking for apts and threat hunting so uh exfiltrations command and control systems build a nice training set of that and then i think this technique would be beautiful for uh for doing threat hunting in organizations, in enterprises. Well, thank, thank you, you very much for your time, Ben and Hussein. We really appreciate it. Um, for the rest of the attendees, we, um, I see someone had their hand raised, but I think they were maybe waving goodbye. Um, we have another session today at 530. That's all about careers in cybersecurity and artificial intelligence. So we'll have uh, representatives from Metro Star Systems and from the National Security uh, Innovation Network there as well. So we'll see you all at 5.30. Thank you again to our uh, panelists. We really had a great, uh, great informative talk and some great discussion. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye. Thank you everybody, bye.